वेलकम टू नॉन स्टॉप न्यूरोन डॉट कॉम वेल लर्निंग मेडिकल कॉन्सेप्ट इज एज इजी एज वॉचिंग कार्टून इन दिस वीडियो वी विल टॉक अबाउट द फिजियोलॉजी ऑफ कॉरोनरी सर्क्यूलेशन फॉर दैट फर्स्ट लेट्स क्विकली रिवाइज सम रिलेवेंट एनाटमी द मेन ब्लड सप्लाई टू द हार्ट कम्स फ्रॉम द राइट कोरोनरी आर्टरी एंड द लेफ्ट कोरोनरी आर्टरी बोथ ओरिजिनेटिंग फ्रॉम द एवर्टा रफली स्पीकिंग the right coronary artery supplies the right atrium and right ventricle and the left coronary artery supplies the left atrium and ventricle now let's see the arrangement of the vessels in a curved section of the valve this is cardiac muscle the main coronary arteries lie over its surface so they are also called epicardial coronary arteries they branch into smaller arteries that penetrate from the surface into the muscle mass then they divide to form a capillary network most of the muscle mass in the heart receives blood from this arterial supply however very thin layer of endocardium of about 0.1 mm receives the nutrients directly from the blood within the chambers so this was the arterial supply talking about venous drainage most of the blood from left ventricle drains into coronary sinus and most of the blood from the right ventricle drains into anterior cardiac veins they both empty the blood into the right atrium this is the main venous drainage apart from this some small vessels called thebaciation veins empty directly into the nearby chamber of the heart the blood entering the left heart this way bypasses the pulmonary circulation so this tiny fraction of blood enters the systemic circulation without getting oxygenated so this was the relevant anatomy now let's see the physiological concepts related to coronary circulation first coronary blood flow under normal conditions the heart receives about 4 to 5% of total cardiac output we know that normal cardiac output is about 5 liters per minute 4 to 5% of that is about 225 ml per minute. The coronary blood flow is about 225 ml per minute. Please note that the heart represents only 0.5% of the total body weight. Thus in terms of tissue mass, the coronary blood flow is very high as compared to that in other tissues. Now, this blood flow is not uniform throughout the cardiac cycle. If we draw the graph of blood flow in the left ventricle during different phases of the cardiac cycle it appears like this During systole the blood flow decreases and during diastole it increases This is because the left ventricle pushes the blood into systemic circulation which has very high resistance So during systole it contracts very forcefully This strong forceful contraction compresses the vessels within the wall of the left ventricle so the blood flow there decreases during diastole the muscle mass relaxes so there is no compression on the vessels and the blood flow increases thus the left ventricle mainly receives blood during diastole however the situation is not so extreme for the right ventricle the right ventricle pumps against the pulmonary circulation which has very low resistance so the right ventricle does not contract as forcefully as the left ventricle does this keeps the vessel compression minimal on the right side so a significant amount of blood keeps flowing during systole thus the blood flow is relatively smoother in right ventricle as compared to that in the left ventricle so this is how the blood flow varies with time during cardiac cycle but this is not it Variation in blood flow occurs with depth of the wall too. To understand that, imagine a group of men standing in a queue in which each man is pushing the man next to him. Here, the force of every previous man is added up for each person. So, the outer person experiences less pressure and the inner person experiences more pressure. Similarly, we have many cardiomyocytes arranged along the thickness of the wall. So when the ventricles contracted during systole the force of each outer muscle mass is added up for the inner muscle mass so the pressure is greater near the endocardium and least near the epicardium
for blood vessels, this results in more compression of vessels in the endocardium than those near the surface. Therefore, the blood flow near the endocardium tends to decrease during systole. However, in a healthy person, this is compensated by more vessels near the endocardium and also by more fall in resistance during the diastole. So normally, the total blood flow in the outer and inner half is almost equal. However, in pathological conditions, the endocardium is more prone to damage for this reason. So this was about the variation in blood flow. Now let's talk about the control of the coronary blood flow. There are two mechanisms involved in this. One is metabolic control and the second is nervous control. First, let's see the metabolic control. This is similar to metabolic control of local blood flow elsewhere in the body. Among many local factors, adenosine is considered to be very important. When there is a decrease in oxygen supply or increase in demand, a large quantity of ATP is degraded to AMP in cardiomyocytes. The AMP then further degrades to adenosine which is released into the interstitium. From here, it diffuses to vascular smooth muscle cells and causes that relaxation. So, the blood vessels dilate which brings more oxygen. Apart from adenosine, other metabolic factors like adenosine phosphate compounds, potassium, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, prostaglandins, nitric oxide, etc. also play a role in local control of the coronary blood flow. Also, autoregulation of coronary blood flow keeps it stable between perfusion pressure of about 70 to 150 mm of mercury. The autoregulation happens by myogenic response and metabolic regulation. This is also similar to autoregulation in other organs like brain and kidney. I have already explained all the local mechanisms in detail in a separate video. So we won't repeat all the detail here. So this was about local control. Now let's talk about the control by the nervous system. First, the effect of sympathetic stimulation. It affects the coronary blood flow in two different ways. First is the direct effect on blood vessels. The sympathetic nerves release noradrenaline that act on alpha receptors on vascular smooth muscles. This causes vasoconstriction which tends to decrease the blood flow. However, the nerves going to SA node increases the heart rate. And those going to cardiomyocytes increase the contractility. These actions increase cardiac work and therefore oxygen consumption. And as we saw earlier, increased oxygen demand brings local control mechanisms into action. And they cause vasodilation which tends to increase the blood flow. Thus, direct action on blood vessels and the indirect effects are opposite to each other. Here, the local control predominates over the direct action. So overall, there is an increase in blood flow. Thus normally, sympathetic stimulation of the heart increases the coronary blood flow. Coming to the parasympathetic stimulation. Here we have the vagus nerve that mainly innervates the SA node only. The parasympathetic innervation to coronary blood vessels in musculature is very scarce. So its direct action on blood vessels is minimal. But at the SA node, the vagal stimulation causes a decrease in heart rate. This decreases the oxygen demand. So, due to the indirect local effects, the blood flow decreases. So, this is all about the control of coronary blood flow. Before we see summary, I want to share some other special points related to coronary circulation. 1. Even under resting condition, the cardiac tissues extract 70-80% to 80 of incoming oxygen. This is very high as compared to average extraction ratio of about 20-30%. to 30%. So, when oxygen demand is increased, the only way to increase its delivery is by increasing the blood flow. The tissue cannot increase the extraction ratio as it is already very high even under resting condition. And second, when oxygen supply is adequate, the cardiomyocyte mainly use fatty acids as their primary source of energy. Under normal condition, 60 to 70 percent of energy comes from fatty acids. So, the contribution of carbohydrates is less. However, under anaerobic or ischemic conditions, 
the anaerobic mechanisms like glycolysis of carbohydrates become important. It produces a large quantity of lactic acid, which may be a cause of pain in case of myocardial ischemia. Third, earlier we saw that in the left ventricle, blood flow is high during diastole. And also, normally duration of diastole is longer than that of systole. So most of the blood flow occurs during diastole. Now, when there is an increase in heart rate, the duration of diastole shortens more than that of systole. This tends to reduce the total blood flow. However, this is compensated by adequate dilution of vessels in response to metabolic signals. So the blood flow is not compromised. So this was all about coronary circulation. Now let's have a quick summary. Normally the heart receives 4-5% to of total cardiac output which is about 225 milliliters per minute. In the left ventricle, the blood flow the blah, 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 blah. In the left ventricle, the blood flow decreases during systole and most of the perfusion occurs during diastole. In the right ventricle, the flow is relatively smooth. Also during systole, the endocardium is compressed more than epicardium. This tends to decrease blood flow over there, but more blood vessels and more fall in resistance during diastole compensate for this negative impact. So overall blood flow in the inner half of the valve is almost equal to that in the outer half. Lack of oxygen or its increased demand increases the formation of adenosine which in turn increases the blood flow. Nervous control mechanisms are also there to regulate the flow, but they are not so important because local factors mostly predominate over them. So this was all about the coronary circulation. For sticking with me until the end, here is a bonus point for you. Earlier we saw the graph showing blood flow in the left ventricle during systole and diastole. This in fact is a simplified graph. A more detailed graph is like this. Here this part is isovolumetric contraction and the remaining is the ejection phase. As you can see here, there is a sharp fall in blood flow during isovolumetric contraction. This is because forceful contraction of ventricle during this compresses the vessels. On top of that, the aortic valve is not open yet. So pressure inside the coronary artery has not raised yet. This weak arterial pressure cannot push blood against very high pressure generated by the ventricular musculature. So there is a drastic fall in blood flow for a brief period. In fact, it may even reverse also. Then as the aortic valve opens, the pressure in the artery increases. So the blood flow increases. During diastole, it increases even further as there is no compression by ventricular musculature. Did you know this detail? Please let me know in the comment. That's it for this video. If you like this video, please share it with your friends and colleagues too. And don't forget to subscribe because lots more to come. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.